we live our lives so that they come to mean something? How can we make a positive difference in the world? For those of us who are privileged to work in professions that generate knowledge, facts, meaning, stories, ideas, understanding, we can hope to do it through our work. But how exactly does our work come to matter? And what happens when we stop believing the stories that we've told ourselves about that? As you just heard, I'm an atmospheric scientist. I study weather and climate. And uh, in 2015, I gave a talk here at TEDx Broadway about Hurricane Sandy and climate change and long-term risks. Um, and I'm here to tell you today about the midlife crisis that I've had since then. <laughs> when I was in my late teens and early 20s, I wanted to be a musician, actually. And I tried that for a little while, but I switched to science partly because I thought it'd be easier to get a steady job doing that. Uh, also, though, scientific research is intellectually satisfying work and even it can be very creative, like music at its best. But also, I wanted to do something that would make a positive difference in the world. So when I chose my um, field of study, when I decided to go P do a PhD, PhD um, I did it with that in mind. This was about 1992. I was 25 or so. And the Kyoto Protocol was being negotiated, but it never got ratified by the US Senate. So here's where we are now. This is a graph from a special report by the IPCC that spells out all the tremendous harms that are going to come to people and other species if we don't keep the warming of the Earth's surface to about a degree and a half Celsius or three degrees Fahrenheit above what it was in pre-industrial times and also spells out what it'll take to do that. So the wiggly line going up is carbon emissions, historically, what they've actually been. And the lines sharply dropping down are what it'll take to reach net zero fast enough. And you can make different assumptions. There's a couple different lines there. But the bottom line, if you look at the past and you compare it to that imagined future, is that it's going to take a radical, immediate change in our energy systems and our economy to avoid really bad outcomes on the global scale. In other words, we have to stop burning fossil fuels as fast as humanly possible, or we're in big trouble. There's uncertainties, but none of them are going to change that fact. And you probably know this radical immediate change is not happening. We're not decarbonizing nearly fast enough. And it's been not happening for decades, and that's how we got here. If we'd started decarbonizing when I was a student, when we knew enough, really, to do it, things would be very different today, but we didn't do that. The international negotiations to reduce carbon emissions that have been going on since that time, and the reason the IPCC reports like that are written, have been a failure. And that failure is in large part due to the intransigence of the United States uh, over that period. The main exception being the Paris Agreement. Obama negotiated the Paris Agreement, which is great, but not nearly enough. And that intransigence is because of the influence and power of the fossil fuel industry in this country and globally. When I was a kid, I loved Star Trek. And I've thought a lot about how this show communicated some beliefs to me that I held until pretty recently without really believing that I held them. So think about the United Federation of Planets. It's a utopian futuristic vision of what the US saw itself to be in the post-war period. Pluralistic, democratic, bringing its way of life to the universe to the benefit of everyone. And think about the role science played in Star Trek, besides the warp drives and the phasers and all the futuristic technologies. It was embodied by Mr. Spock, science officer, my favorite character, and based on my informal unscientific poll, favorite character of a lot of scientists. In nearly every episode, the crew of the Enterprise would get in some kind of trouble. They'd, their lives would be in danger. And in a lot of those episodes, Spock would analyze the data and come up with some sciencey solution, and then he'd tell it to Captain Kirk, and Kirk would trust Spock's judgment and implement, order it implemented and save everybody. In 1987, when I was an undergraduate in college, Ronald Reagan signed the Montreal Protocol, banning the substances that caused the ozone hole. Different problem from global warming, but kind of similar. I wasn't a fan of Reagan then, and I'm not now. But looking at that, you can see how a young scientist might think 
that US democracy, for all its problems, knew how to take in scientific information and do the right thing with it. I don't think I was completely naive. I've known all this time that our country wasn't doing the right thing on climate and a lot of other ways besides that, but I still had some kind of implicit faith that we had a rational system that would eventually respond to the information that climate scientists were putting out in the public interest. If you'd asked me whether I believed that, say, 10 or 15 years ago, I would have said no. I thought I was kind of cynical about uh, politics and the situation with climate. But I know now that I did believe it. And how I came to know that was when Donald Trump got elected in 2016. Among the many reasons that made me upset was that it called into question my identity as a scientist and a scholar. I thought, if this guy can be elected president, what does that mean for those of us whose jobs are about facts and knowledge and understanding? Of course, Trump was totally hostile to any action on climate, but it was worse than that. Here's a quote from the late radio talk show host, Rush Limbaugh. And I've taken it from philosopher Jason Stanley's appropriately titled book, How Fascism Works. So Limbo says, the four corners of deceit, government, academia, science, and the media, those institutions are now corrupt and exist by virtue of deceit. So in other words, don't believe anything other than what the great leader tells you. And indeed, in 2020, under President Trump, Limbo got a presidential medal of freedom. Of course, Trump's not president now, but the Supreme Court's controlled by people he put in power, and somebody like him or him, he himself may be president again soon and might control Congress and maybe even most of the states. We may come to look back on what we've experienced so far as just a mild prelude, and that scares me more than global warming does. In the introductions to our scientific papers and our grant proposals, we climate scientists write things like, we're going to reduce on the uncertainties in the science in climate projections so that we can give better information to decision makers so that they can make better decisions. But we know now that the decision makers either aren't listening or they're not acting on it or they can't act on it. And the reasons for that have nothing to do with the scientific uncertainties. They're about politics and money and power. And we need to admit to ourselves, we climate scientists, that is, that we have a conflict of interest here. Reducing the uncertainties is our job, so it's in our interest to say it's important. But we already know that we need to know enough to act. And there's no reducing of uncertainty that's going to change that picture. We're going to change the mind of anyone who's already decided that they're not convinced. So we have to face the fact that the climate problem is not a science problem anymore, it's a political problem. And when we try to make it back into a science problem, we play in the hands of those who oppose action. So that makes us scientists less important when we understand that, but it's also true, and we really want to be on the right side of this one. So what should we do in this situation? And there's few different answers you can give. I'm going to talk about three of them that might be possible. Here's one answer from another American science fiction myth, and this is where my head went after the 2016 election. It's Yoda in The Empire Strikes Back, of course, different franchise. The Jedi had been wiped out. He's there by himself eating swamp weeds on this miserable planet, Dagobah, waiting for a good graduate student to show up. That's how I think about it. And uh, I thought of this when Trump got elected, and I wonder, what's the job of an academic scientist mean now? In other words, keep the faith. That's one answer. The world needs what we do, after all, one way or another. And there's a lot of worse ways to spend your life than trying to understand this planet that we live on. Another choice, and one that I've made to some extent in my own work, is to focus on the science of climate adaptation. We have to adapt, uh, no matter what happens. And that means upgrading infrastructure to make it more climate resilient, figuring out when and how to get people out of harm's way when we have to do that, and doing a lot of other things that we have to do to deal with the warming we've already experienced, the climate change we've already experienced, and the more that is almost inevitable. 
And to do that right, we really do need to reduce some scientific uncertainties about how climate change will manifest locally and the impacts it'll have. So that's another possible answer. Third possible answer is maybe we should spend more time and effort on activism and less on science. There have been times in the last few years where for the first time in my career, I've started wondering if there's a point to doing what I do. I think I've come out on the right side of that, but we have to be able to confront that question. Otherwise, we scientists are just another interest group advocating for ourselves. So I don't know the answer. Those are three answers, there could be many others. I just know we have to stop kidding ourselves. We're not on the bridge of the enterprise, maybe we never were. We can't count on some benevolent power structure to do the right thing. Instead, we have to understand not just how to do our work, which we're already pretty good at, but how it lives in the larger world. And we have to try to do our best to make that consistent with our values. In other words, we have to come up with some more grown-up stories about what we're doing, why it matters, and how it matters, and then we have to try to make those true. Thank you. Thank you.